year or two, it seems like there's a big scandal where a memoir becomes a big hit and only later we discover that parts of it have been exaggerated or worse, totally faked. People feel betrayed and the author is tarred and feathered because autobiography is supposed to be about truth. Memoir and autobiography is one of the most common narrative genres in comics today, but can artists really draw their own truth? I'm Andrea Gilroy and this is Comics Crash Course. In the next two videos, I'll be looking at popular genres in comics. While the series has been about formal theory overall, these next two videos focus on narrative theory, and that is how certain kinds of narratives work. As is often the case, form and narrative feed into each other, so graphic memoirs use the formal nature of comics to complicate the nature of autobiographical storytelling, which is the point of today's video. I'm going to talk about a few of the ways comics form affects truth-telling in graphic memoir today. And just FYI, I'm going to use the terms autobiography and memoir somewhat interchangeably in this video. That's not entirely kosher for folks who study the genre more closely, but I think you'll see why comics maybe makes me feel a little more comfortable with the slippage as we go on. So, truth. You can't handle the truth! Truth and autobiography is a little bit tricky because you're talking about somebody's life and their experiences. But we know that memory is fallible and experience is subjective. So the whole concept of truth in autobiography is kind of fuzzy. But when you say that, you run the risk of sounding like you don't believe an author's experience or that there's no difference between authors who outright lie to take advantage of an audience and authors who are working through the difficulty of representing reality, history, and experience. And that's not what I'm trying to say. In a famous essay, critic Merle Brown distinguishes between stories that are fictive and fictitious. Now his essay focused on fiction, but he wanted to get at why some stories have a sense of truthfulness about them, something that gestures towards reality. And you can imagine why folks who study autobiography find this essay pretty important. So in his chapter on autobiographical comics, in his book Alternative Comics, Charles Hatfield sums up the difference in Brown's essay quite succinctly. And so I will quote him rather than try to put it in my own words. A story may be fictive yet truthful, quote, insofar as it implies in itself the art of its making. In contrast, a story, autobiographical or otherwise, that does not acknowledge its own making is merely fictitious. The fictive, then, problematizes itself when the merely fictitious strives for transparency. Now, transparency is normally something that we think of as a pretty good thing. But when it comes to the complicated nature of truth construction in memoir and autobiography, it's a little more complicated. Here, transparency means something that just appears to be true with nothing to hide. As I've been trying to say, it's more complicated than that when it comes to memory and experience. So the form of comics makes it even more complicated because a comic artist has to draw themselves. And that means that visual representation gets thrown into the blender alongside all of the things that I've already mentioned, truth, history, experience, memory. Remember the big triangle? The point of it was that visual representations are created in response to several possible goals. To represent an objective reality, to signify concepts and ideas, to visualize formal elements themselves. You can check out the video on the big triangle for more details. So when it comes time for an artist to choose how to represent themselves visually, what aspects of themselves are they trying to portray? Are they trying to portray concepts and ideas of themselves? Emotional realities? Are they trying to play with elements of form? Or are they trying to make something that looks like themselves? What is the most truthful representation? Take, for instance, one of the most famous graphic memoirs of all time, at least in English, Mouse. So Mouse made it to the top of the New York Times bestseller list, but it was put in the fiction section. And Spiegelman was 
outraged, saying, quote, I shudder to think how David Duke would respond to seeing a carefully researched work based closely on my father's memories of life in Hitler's Europe and in death camps, classified as fiction. And it's hard to blame him. One of the Times editors responded, well, let's go out to Spiegelman's house and see if a giant mouse answers the door. We'll move it to the nonfiction side of the list then. Now, eventually the Times did move Mouse to the nonfiction list. But cartooning and drawing has to make us think about the nature of truth, of fact, in a different way than, say, photography. In Spiegelman's case, it made readers consider ethnicity and national identity. It made us think about the historical trajectory of comics, from funny animal newspaper strips to the underground comics movement Spiegelman was coming out of. It made us think about all of the symbolic connotations of might. It also made us think about why Spiegelman chose to use animals instead of to draw people that looked like him. These added emotional, formal, and narrative complexity to Mouse, as well as representing aspects of the truth of art in Vladek's experience, despite being obviously not true. They weren't mice. To return to some of the concepts that Merle Brown uses, uh, Mouse is a text that understands its own making. The text frequently shows scenes of Artie taping his conversations with Vladek, or as digressions in which Art discusses what it means to write this memoir. So while, yes, Spiegelman isn't literally a mouse, that part is fictional. By highlighting his own hand in the process of making his memoir, his own biases and thoughts and feelings and actions, the mouse drawing is part of that, Spiegelman's memoir is in some ways more truthful than someone who tries to present a version of their history and experience that is transparently true without complication. A fascinating thing about this act of creating a self-image is how integral a role the artist-author themselves plays in the act. They're literally drawing themselves as they see themselves and or, and never has a slash been so loaded, how they think others see them. Hatfield, who I mentioned earlier, writes that the cartoon self works both from the inside out and the outside in. The artist has complete control over how they are seen and can exaggerate that image to whatever extent and toward whatever purpose they see fit. He writes that the cartoonist, quote, projects and objectifies his or her inward sense of self, achieving at once a sense of intimacy and critical distance. Emotional interpretation often exceeds and even sabotages literal description when it comes to this cartoon self. At the same time, cartooning doesn't come from nowhere. As Hatfield writes, quote, cartooning does the work from the outside in, using culturally significant stereotypes to convey impressions of people that are seemingly spontaneous, yet deeply coded. Thus, the most basic aspects of comics memoir and autobiography, drawing yourself, puts the complex nature of the self and autobiography in the spotlight. Hatfield also points to another formal feature of comics, repetition and succession, as a fruitful way of understanding how we understand the past and the self. You see, in comics, there literally isn't a single unitary self. There are many individual selves represented on the page across many panels. This literalizes the way that we shift and change over time, the way that little flashes of memory come together to form a story. Unlike film, in which everything appears seamless and cohesive, the comics page makes you work to put together the fragments. This more accurately represents the way that memory works. And it's especially true of traumatic memory, which not only frequently is experienced as a kind of fragmentary memory, but is often experienced through painful repetitions. Thus, the panels of the page act as a visualization of repeated fragments of traumatic memory. This is an idea explored further in the works of Marianne Hirsch and Hilary Shute. You should check out their work. So this has been another heady episode, but I think, and I hope, a valuable one. Graphic memoirs are one of the most popular forms of comic, especially when it comes to comics used in the classroom. We've moved through this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of great scholarship if you'd like to know more. Add your favorite book or article in the comments below. Next time, talk about the other big genre in comics, superheroes. See you then.